today or this year is the 400th year that people from Africa was brought to this, this country and enslaved. Um, and I'm going to talk about a, an individual who was born 199 years into the institution. Um, but first I want to go back just briefly and talk about the ships and um, the great ships that some people thought took a uh, year out of the Dark Ages. And the reason that those ships came about was because that group of people of color came up from North Africa and started to encroach, actually take over parts of Southern Europe and uh, <coughs> brought architecture, universities. In fact, there was no universities in Europe until the Moors uh, arrived. Mathematics and engineering. But there was no talk about race in those days because race was a concept that was developed after the document of discovery. But basically, the Pope said, as our great ships go out into the world and come upon land that to keep the, the warring nature of the Europeans from fighting each other, basically said, any land that you come upon that's not previously claimed by one of the other European powers, you can claim that land for yourself and the church. And a few years after that, some scholars started to question why that was the case. And the Pope went out similar, similar to climate deniers today and found their own scholars and said, we need something that help explain what we're doing here. And they came up with the concept of race. And then that, as you can see, put the uh, Europeans at the top and various other groups farther down. Um, the enslaved people of Africa, what they call dark Africa, was considered at the bottom and nothing done to those folks was ever considered wrong. The other thing that, in my mind, that drives the concept of slavery was the concept of monarchy. And that had been in place for millenniums. And the structure was, there was a small group at the top, and the masses had no power, they were to be controlled, and the people who went into the southern part of the U.S. liked that concept, but they didn't want to do the work. So they, their first approach was, as we capture the indigenous people, they will do the work. <coughs> Interestingly, the indigenous people had three ways of reacting to that. The first one was they had no immunity to the European disease, and they died off in droves. The second response was they didn't like it, so they fought back. They had sticks and stones. In English, we call them bow and arrows and spears. And the Europeans had gunpowder, shot, and metal, guns, and swords. And the third thing that the indigenous people realized is that with the disease and the war machine, they could run away and hide. So the southerners decided they needed other people to come in and do the work so they could live like royalty. And thus, 400 years ago today, or this year, they brought people over from Africa. Now I want to talk about the great man who was born, as I said, 199 years into the institution of slavery. Frederick Douglass <coughs> was born in 1820.
was born in 1818. Um, there was never ever proof of who his father was. Speculation was it was a plantation owner, but the plantation owner also had sons 21 and 18 years old. And so what we do know that he was half white. So, and I will try not to use the word white because I don't like that term. So I will use Euro or Asian or Africa, Americans, which is also an interesting concept. There's, there's no actual place of Europe, Asia, or Africa on the map. I mean, you can, in general, it's spoken about, but there's no country by that name. Um, as I was doing research, trying to figure out when Douglas was born, I kept getting February of 1818. Uh, finally, I came upon this piece of data that said, because his mother was enslaved, there was no reason to know the date that he was born. Like, can you imagine living in an environment where time didn't matter? That was so ingrained into our culture. So she called him her Valentine's baby, which says that he was born on February 14th. But since I'm born on February 13th, I'm just going to assume he was born on the 13th. <laughs> Uh, in those days, when the plantation owners had a, a, a child, they would often assign a slave child to be their playmate. And Douglas was fortunate enough to be assigned to be the playmate of his owner's son. His, the uh, wife of the plantation owner didn't realize that she was not supposed to teach Douglas to read and write. But it was so much easier to teach her son if she had someone else there. And Douglas was a very smart kid and he picked up stuff really well. And so she taught him to read and write. I want to make one other comment. I shared the previous reading because that was one of the times in my life that I did something that I did not know I knew how to do a week before that. It's, it's just with whatever was going on in my world that came to be as a work. Imagine Frederick Douglass and everything that he did, it was all brand new and beyond his knowing as he went forward. So at the age of 15, they decided that he should become a field slave. He served his purpose as the buddy to the plantation's own son, and Douglas didn't like that. So responding to that, what often happened, he was sold south. He was born in, in Maryland. He was sold to Virginia to a so-called professional slave breaker. Uh, Douglas had met this woman, Anna Mary, some people say a church, who was a free black woman. And she was older than him, but they had a connection. And after about a week in Virginia, Douglas took off, um, went to Maryland, uh, pretended to be a sailor on leave, took three ships and uh, various trains and got to New York. Then he sent, to, sent a letter back to Anna to ask him to join him, him. and she basically did the same uh, conveyances to get back, get to New York. The thing is that Anna, even though she was free, was illiterate. So she had to go find someone who could read the letter to her. But within three weeks, she, she was in New York, they got married, and she bore him five children, four that lived into adulthood. Douglas was in New York and he saw this sign. 
presentation on the plight of the enslaved people. I'm sure they didn't use those words, but I don't like the word slavery, so I try to avoid it. Um, and Douglas went to see, see this, and he ran into William Lord Harrison, who was put on this presentation and was a great abolitionist. And he saw right away the potential in Douglas. And from there, Douglas became one of the uh, great orators of his time. Um, he spoke all over the U.S. against the evil of slavery. And one of the ways that he pitched it was it's not only horrible for those people who are enslaved, but it drains the soul of the slaveholders. And it creates a culture within our country that is a cancer that will destroy us if we don't eliminate it. And some of those words were garrisons, but uh, Douglas continued to do that. <laughs> I, I apologize, but um, there was so much to be said. So, during this time, the Southerners saw the potential of Douglas, and they put up a hundred thousand dollar reward on his head. So he had to leave the U.S and go to England. While he was, just before he left, he had got some people to negotiate to buy his freedom. And he got a response from Garrison that he did not expect. Garrison said, I will not spend one copper penny uh, to give to a slave owner. Now, a few years ago, I worked for General Motors, and we had this situation where we wanted to have a better relationship with the um, union. So the corporation assigned some managers, like myself, and the union assigned some up and coming union leaders, and we were going to work to make the relationship between the UAWG and better. And the guy who was assigned to me was a young white man whose son, whose family had come out of the South but he was a real strong union guy. And he had this term that had to do with um, when somebody did something outrageous or grossly inappropriate, he would say, that's mighty white of you. And I had never, I had not heard that term from even a black person, but along with this was a young white guy, and I was thoroughly impressed. <laughs> so, I think Garrison's response was mighty white of him. <laughs> <laughs> but Douglas did take off for Europe. They negotiated a price of $740. So the, the communication was, we've got your freedom. Douglas said, I will not set a foot on the ship until I have the paper in my hand. They, they did that, he came back to the US. While he was there, he had met this young woman, 21, 20 years his junior, named Helen Pitts. She was a uh, European person, um, pale in color. And when he came back, she came back. Um, for, for years, she supported him from a distance. When Anna Mary got ill, she lived in the Douglas's house and nursed, and nursed her. And two years after she passed away, she married Douglas, and they lived for approximately 11 years together before he passed away. Now, more about Douglas. The great man was a number one bookseller. He uh, was the first United States Marshal in this country. He encouraged Lincoln to let the enslaved people fight, and led, which led to the Emancipation Proclamation. He was also an amb ambassador to Haiti. Uh, he was on the road speaking 11 months out of the year. He was considered one of the top three orators of his day. 
And he actually got wealthy through all of this. In my mind, to try to convey what impact he had on the 19th century, I would say you'd have to combine Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, Jackie Robinson, and Martin Luther King to come close to the contribution that he made for the black people and in, and in turn for, to the, uh, the country at large. But he wasn't always successful. He, uh, when he was told that the Senate and the House didn't have sufficient numbers to pass the uh, 13th Amendment while including women, he had a session with uh, Katie Stanton, uh, Elizabeth Katie Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony, and told them, we must take what we can get. And they stopped speaking to each other for years. Uh, in terms of trying to react, in my mind, to that, he um, decided to run for vice president in 1872 with uh, Victoria Woodhall. Um, there was three big things wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> they were Republicans and there were President Ulysses S. Grant running for his second term. Problem number one. Problem number two. Ms. Woodhall was a participant in what was known in those days as the uh, as free love. Her attitude was that if men could meet someone they were attracted to and get, become intimate with them within a day, she could too. And had actually practiced that more than a few times. <laughs> And thirdly, she was 32. Even if she won, she couldn't have taken the office <laughs> for three years. So I don't know if he was trying to see the good graces of the, the feminists of his day, because he were the only male to speak at the Senator Falls uh, session for women's suffrage. But that one didn't turn out very well. So. He had a meeting in 1895 with Susan B. Anthony, and they resolved their issues. He went home, he was in jubil he was jubilant, getting ready for dinner, and dropped dead. So even in death, he was still trying to make the world a better place. Now I'm gonna do a brief comparison to one other person, and that person, and some of you who know me might have heard this name before, William Marcellus Harris. He, he was a young man in the South, Tennessee, who uh, owned a freight business. And being a young white man, when the war broke out, he joined the Confederacy, became an officer. Somewhere along the way, I'm not sure, I'm still digging, he had a conversion, and he joined the Union Army. And I don't know if this was like in the song, um, um, Amazing Grace, where the sea captain, the captain has this great transformation. I don't know if he was at Fort Pillow, I heard about Fort Pillow, and that changed his mind. And uh, being with this group, I know most of you know, but I will share. Fort Pillow was a small Union fort on the Mississippi in western Tennessee. And they got surrounded by a much larger uh, Confederate Army in 1844. Uh, the officers went out to the Confederates and sued for truth, for peace. Uh, the Union leader, I'm sorry, the, the Confederate leader, um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, 
negotiated that if they would load their weapons into wagons, bring them through the, the, the Confederate's line, they could surrender. Then the officers, who were all European Americans, uh, came through the lines, and the enlisted men, it was uh, ex-enslaved men, was mur murdered on the spot. 300 of them just shot down a bayonet. Um, there was an article in the National Tennessean two, two years ago uh, that uh, the, uh, the, they talked about William Marcellus Harris and basically they stated that he had taken up with an ex-enslaved woman and they had six kids. And I'm gonna jump ahead seriously here. The oldest of those six kids was named Henry Holman. And he named his son after the last Unitarian Universalist president of this country, William Howard Taft. So my father was William Taft Hillman. Um, I don't know if there was serious love involved in this. I'm still searching. But I do know that the first school and the first church that I went to was donated by Harris's sister and the family that she married into to the black community. So, just so much to be said here. I'm gonna jump ahead and talk about what people have said to me about why I should do this service. And the first thing I'm gonna say is reinforce the comments about social justice, that there are people in this community who are making a special effort. I think on a personal basis, we have serious issues in this country in the short term. There was a person on Fox News who was a um, aide or contributor to the current administration, and he basically said, we are at war, and I tell my friends to vote, vote and go buy guns. That's awful. So what I would encourage, and I'm not your minister, so you don't have to worry about executing this stuff. <laughs> um, the first thing I would say is be observant. Those, those four things that I'm going to talk about, um, some of you just said, wait a minute, you held up three fingers. Others who was in, seriously in the basketball said, you just signal a three-point shot that was good. <laughs> in reality, I just flashed white out. And to be observant, what I mean by that is that when I share with my daughter that this service is going to be done, and I flash that, she says, oh my God, when I was in high school, kids would do that. And if they caught somebody looking, they had the right to punch you in the shoulder or the thigh. That was in Bloomfield Hill School System, right where this congregation is. The second thing I would be, be encouraging of is to try to deal with the great differences in privilege. There's a stand your ground law in Florida, and there's people of, of color are often shot by non-people of color, and they walk away from it. Yet, under the same law, there was a black woman whose husband was giving her trouble in her house. She had a gun, she fired it, into the ceiling to convey to him, you need to leave now. She's doing 20 years in prison. Nobody was shot, legal gun in her own home. The level of privilege there is just grossly inappropriate. Three, the other end. We've, it took us 200 years to find out that Sally Hemings' children were Thomas Jefferson's children. 
We also found out that Sally Hemings' father and Thomas Jefferson's Euro spouse were had the same father. So we don't talk about Alexander Hamilton. Well, maybe we do now because of the play. <laughs> Babe Ruth, he, he was called an N-word more than any other player except for maybe Jackie Robinson when he was playing. Dwight D. Eisenhower, we started to learn a little bit more about his family background. But maybe we're making progress because Ted Williams announced after he left baseball, but before he died, who his mother was, and Carol Channing also communicated about who her family was. But this talk was basically designed for to talk about love. And I want to say to you that my sense of Tom, of, uh, of the great Douglas, that he did awful lot of what he did out of love. I got love for Anna. Later on, love for Helen. I, he loved the enslaved people, and he put himself through great harm to, to move along. And thirdly, I think he loved this country. He wanted it to move toward its better angels. So I would like for you to repeat after me. And, and it's gonna be love with period, love with the question mark, and love with the explanation point. Love really. Love really. Love really. Love really. Love really. Love really. 